Proceeding will start shortly. Order and welcome to today's uh, session of the Transport Select Committee. Uh, this is the second part of a double bill. Uh, we had the civil aviation in front of us uh, last uh, Wednesday uh, and yourselves uh, today. Before we get going, if we'd ask you just please to state your name and uh, position in your organisation. Start with you, Mr. Rolfe. I'm Martin Rolfe and I'm the CEO of Nats. Hi, I'm Catherine Leahy and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Nats. Thank you, and we're very grateful for uh, your time uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is a follow-up uh, session uh, to the, the one we did last autumn following the uh, air traffic control incident uh, last summer. Um, and since then, the uh, Civil Aviation have published their interim uh, report uh, and will probably want to return uh, to the subject when the final report uh, is published uh, later this year. Uh, but if I could start uh, with a, a general question uh, and invite you to give your thoughts on that interim report uh, and what work you have been doing uh, to follow on from some of the recommendations that it made. Uh, Mr Rolfe, I could ask you to start. Uh, thank you very much and um, thank you for inviting us back. Um, we obviously always appreciate the opportunity to come back and, and talk about what we're doing. Um, in terms of the interim report, uh, I think what we were most pleased about with the report was that broadly it concurred with our findings uh, that we supplied back in uh, September and our original interim investigation. Um, that we understood the cause of the issue, uh, we understood how it had come about, we understood the nature of the failure, um, we understood how to fix it and that we had fixed it and obviously we've seen nothing since, uh, we've had good service since. Um, it identified some of the same areas uh, that we'd identified in our original report around areas where we can make improvements, um, particularly uh, around uh, communications and such like and, and maybe I'll turn to Catherine in a moment just to give a bit more of an update on that. Um, but from a practical perspective with the report, we um, engaged with the committee on a number of different occasions. Um, we, that started off by uh, they uh, joined us down at Swanwick, our main control centre, um, and we took them through all of our activities that we do there, so a sort of familiarisation, spent a day answering questions that they had, uh, helping them understand the systems that we have, how we operate, how we uh, fix faults and so on. Uh, and then we've had subsequent um, follow-ups, both written and oral, and then we also spent uh, another day with them very recently. They've probably seen, I would say, upwards of 20 people in our organisation. Um, it's been a very open and transparent and constructive collaboration, and we very much look forward to seeing their final report when it's written. Um, if I may, um, it would be a good opportunity for Catherine just to talk a little bit about some of the changes we've made already, particularly around communications as a result of last year, ahead of this summer. Thank you. So I joined in November and I was really encouraged to see that actually work was well underway on improving the communications and uh, following the feedback from the interim report and a lot of the, um, the criticism that Nats had laid upon themselves in that initial report was um, absolutely in hand. So what we've done since then um, is we've um, improved the technology that we have to host multi-stakeholder conference calls. As you'd imagine having 300 to 400 participants on a call, it's not easy to coordinate. Um, and we did a lot of dry runs. Uh, to make sure that worked well and they have been tested in earnest during the recent winter storms and the feedback from the aviation community, both airports and airlines, has been really positive. We've also improved the processes of escalation and notification of incidents and we continue to do quite a lot of work with our airline partners about that notification process and how quickly we tell them that something has happened. Thank you, and um, my colleagues will probably want to explore the, that communications point uh, in more depth later. But just a, 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 the sort of the, the general level, um, do you think the recommendations from the interim report you can get on with now, or are you still holding back some until uh, sort of taking action on some until you've seen the final report? 
Um, oh, no, I, we, we are absolutely getting in action. In fact, we started um, getting into action straight after the 28th of August or as soon as we'd resolved the issue um, based on the findings of our own internal reports. Uh, obviously, then, when we received the CAA's independent panel interim uh, report, um, we cross-checked that with ours and we've added, obviously, uh, the recommendations coming from that. Um, there's nothing in there at this point uh, which we either didn't already have in action or, or haven't now got into action on. Um, there's obviously some wider considerations they're looking at around other stakeholders and such like, and the, to some extent the um, resilience of the entire system, which obviously we can't do on our own. Um, but one of the things that we have, and, and Catherine has uh, taken this on herself, one of the recommendations is around multi-stakeholder um, uh, preparedness and running um, uh, practice scenarios. And actually, that's one of the things that Catherine's proposed back to the CA that we take the lead on for the first time. And uh, I think the airlines, the CA is supportive, the airlines and airports are supportive, and we are planning to do an industry-wide practice run for a disruption scenario um, after the summer. Um, so we're already in action on, on almost everything in there. I'm going to say you're planning that after the summer. Yeah. Why not before? Given um, that the, the summer is the, the peak, uh, peak season. Um, so you'll appreciate that uh, to be to be really valuable, those sorts of things take an awful lot of coordination. Um, it's obviously going to have to be arranged via the Civil Aviation Authority um, and with all of the stakeholders, airlines, airports and so on. And we're already in the summer season now, so the summer schedule started in uh, Easter. So we're actually at the point now where all the preparation for the summer has largely been done as an industry. Uh, we have coordination forums uh, that we think are right for heading into the summer, but this would be an additional piece that we can use after the summer to make us even better for next year. Thank you. Um, and one last question from me at the minute before I, I turn to questions. I'd just like to read back to you um, a comment made at our session last week uh, by Sir Stephen Hillier, the chair of the CAA. Uh, and th these are his words. The interim report pointed to the challenges of resilience in the system. If up to 700,000 people are affected by an incident that lasted for about six hours before we were into the recovery phase, it shows that the system is running pretty tight. This is something that needs to be looked at further. Can you expand or well, firstly reply to that and then expand on what areas need to be further explored? Yes, by all means. Uh, when uh, Sir Stephen was talking about the system there, <clears throat> my understanding is he means the aviation system in, in its entirety, um, rather than the NATS system and the NATS resilience piece. Um, I think his point, the point that he was making there, obviously I don't want to speak for him, but the way I interpreted it was that he is talking about the fact that even if we have a short outage of our systems uh, and recover relatively quickly, um, at a point in the summer, and it could be pretty much any point in the summer, you know, it's always busy in the summer from the start of the school holidays to the end of August, probably even longer. Um, there's always going to be a challenge with repatriation, people catching up on flights that have been cancelled. So I think what he's referring to there is the system works in such a tight environment that there is literally no space to recover uh, in the period following a, a disruption. And that's one of the reasons why, first of all, we, we think it would be good to practice it as a multi-stakeholder um, engagement, but also why we have spent an awful lot of time on making sure that our recovery procedures are as fast as they can possibly be, because the, the shorter we can make that disruption, the better um, for the industry overall. Thank you. Uh, Gavin. Um, thanks uh, very much, Chair. So the, the report makes fairly or well, the interim report, I should say, uh, makes fairly interesting reading. The first point I'd like to address um, is about the joint decision-making model that's flagged up in the, in the interim report. Um, in other words, there's no single post holder um, with accountability in, in, in these situations. Can you perhaps explain that model in a bit more detail? Uh, yeah, by all means. I I, ironically, to a committee. Sorry? Ironically, to a committee. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'll take your point. Um, so I should probably start by saying that is something that we think is a, is, is a fair observation. And so we are going to change to run our uh, gold, silver and bronze command in a slightly different way going forward, where we will have a single accountable um, post holder for a disruption event. Um, the way we run our uh, escalation process is that the bronze 
um, incident will be stood up, which is probably going to be a technical incident, but not necessarily. It could be operational. Um, and it could be obviously an airport or it could be at one of our centres or it could be at a remote site that serves all of those things. Um, so one of the reasons that we've had multiple strands is because we have multiple sites and services to consider. And you can imagine, obviously, that um, whilst there might be an incident at an airport, that might not have an impact over the network. I think what we've realised over the course of looking at things we could do better that actually going to a model where we effectively stand up all of it under a single individual bronze, silver, gold, uh, particularly silver and bronze, which really resolve the problem, um, would probably be a better model. <clears throat> and it would probably allow for better dissemination uh, of information. Um, I could certainly ask Catherine to explain a little more if you'd like more detail there. Well, yeah, and if, if you can, Catherine, in terms of, are, you going to, are we also going to look at what pertains about a silver, bronze or gold incident, etc. as well, because obviously that's um, the designation of an incident may differ potentially to the rest of the industry in terms of how its importance, etc. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work underway to that point. What we're doing at the moment is, with our key stakeholders, is making sure that we are all talking in a common language. So I've come from an airports background and previously an airline background, and we're going to follow exactly the escalation processes that are common across airlines and airports, but also the Metropolitan Police and the Hampshire Police. There is a really standard way of, uh, of, of the escalations. So we will follow everybody else. We were broadly following everybody else, but they're just at that single point in each strand of the command process. And you, Martin, you said have you're going to have a single post holder essentially mm -hmm. responsible. Um, I take it that means you haven't quite changed those processes yet. Are you waiting for the final report before you change the processes? Uh, What's the time scale here before you? No, no, we're, we're well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so that's underway at the moment. What we're doing is, is we're in the process of training at the different levels. Um, so we're in the process of training the new bronze commanders, um, and we've got the silver commanders um, training starting uh, sort of what I would describe as before the main summer peak, which is um, mid June. Um, and then I suppose if I can move on to the, the issue with um, engineers. Mm. So you, obviously in October, when you were before the committee, you said that you had the right number of engineers on site, but obviously the report. Kind of says something different um, th than that. Um, the report says that or has made comments about the effects of certain staff not being on site um, mm. at the time of the incident. In fact, it says the so level two engineer obviously was, was on not on site, um, and it took after attempting to fix the problem remotely, it took one and a half hours for that engineer to arrive. Um, then the, the escalation protocols meant that the level three engineer was not sought for more than three hours after the failure, and obviously this is something that's affecting hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and that, in fact, that level of the engineer was unfamiliar with the fault message. And so the software company wasn't even contacted until uh, four hours after the incident started. Obviously that's um, far from ideal. So what's going to be the process now in terms of how your engineers are rostered, where they're stationed, and that kind of escalation process when dealing with a problem? Um, is, thank you for that question. It's, it's really helpful to be able to maybe clarify that a little bit, and that's something we are still discussing, discussing with the independent panel. So we have uh, engineers at every site, um, and those are engineers that are specially trained to resolve issues. Um, and just to give you a sense of the, the number of issues they resolve, um, since 2016, when we sort of started measuring in, in the way we currently do, um, we've had 54,000 technical issues that have had to be solved by that group of engineers and something like 99.8 no sorry 99.98 something percent of those are solved by that initial group so the vast majority of problems are solved by the people who are on site all the time by which I mean they're 365 rostered on they will be actually at the site when a problem becomes particularly complex that's when we go to our design engineers and the way I would sort of suggest it's easy to think about this is the first line of support on site is like the roadside assistance they get you back and operating and that's our model the second line is more of your design engineers so they get called in when we really don't understand the problem it's relatively rare that they get called in 
Um, and when they do, um, obviously they then apply their expertise to it. Now those people, there's a relatively small number of them, um, probably, you know, it's, it's a, I'll, I'll follow up happily with the committee with the exact numbers, but it's a much smaller number than we have of first line engineers because these are real experts. And of course they're not, they cover multiple systems, so they don't have one particular place to be. They will be working nine to five, generally speaking, at a suitable location. But on any given day, they might be called to another location where the problem is, if it's difficult to solve. So the process we have is we always have them rostered on call. So they're always available. Some of the time they will be in the office anyway. And I think out of those 54,000 incidents, I think of all of those, only 10 caused any delay to the public, of which this was the only one um, where the absence of that um, second line engineer or the fact that it took him an hour and a half to get to work um, on a bank holiday on call uh, has had any impact on the recovery um, the recovery time. So I think we are naturally looking at how we do all of that anyway because we you know, we obviously take the opportunity to, but fundamentally we are operating a very similar model to almost all of the rest of crit critical national infrastructure when it comes to our first, second and third line engineering. Um, when it comes to the manufacturer, uh, to the second half of your question, um, it's a very fine line as to when we contact the manufacturer of a particular uh, piece of equipment because generally manufacturers are there to design and deliver equipment. They're not necessarily the best people to use to fault find or restore a service. That's not what they're there for. And obviously when we do go to them, we have to go to them having been through all of the procedures uh, having tried everything that is the normal sort of standard recovery approach and you would only then go to them when you've got effectively exhausted that and um, also collected enough data for them to be usefully able to understand the problem. Um, again though what we've done just to make sure that um, we couldn't be, uh, we, 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 that we're as prepared as we can possibly be um, is to go through all of our procedures with all of our engineers and all of our suppliers to make sure that the point at which we call them is very clear, the point at which we escalate is very clear, that we've got all the right information for when we do escalate, uh, just to make sure that our timeline for restoration is as quick as it can possibly be. Well, I suppose that, that's the, the critical point I was going to come on to in terms of the urgency of, of that time scale, yeah. because obviously, to use your analogy, when you, I think you said um, engineer on site or roadside, roadside assistance, yeah. but obviously... Um, this isn't a bus that, or, or okay. that is broken down. This is obviously a national network that's affecting hundreds of thousands of people at any given time um, when, there's a, when there's an issue. And I think, giving evidence, I think it was EasyJet and Ryanair both said it cost them around £15 million each just in cost for that day, but in associated costs, it would have cost them multiples of that. So it's so it's, it's about the urgency of the timetable and trying to get these problems resolved, I think, as part of... Uh, as part of the issue um, with regard to that, so look forward to seeing what the new plan is. The only other point I want to uh, raise, Chair, is around um, contingency plans. Um, I'm, I'm obviously M MP for Glasgow Airport, um, and I think some of the issues are around the contingency plans that you have, for instance, such as this, in terms of the manual work, etc., that you'd have to do, resulting in an 85% reduction in capacity, and obviously in network capacity, which means obviously put some of the costs I've just mentioned, um, make them seem rather small in, in potential knock-on effects to airports and um, passengers and businesses, etc. Um, is there anything you can do to improve the contingency plans and uh, can make that a little more robust and have more network capacity in those situations? Um, so, um, I'm not saying it's suggesting it's easy. No, 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 no I'm, happy, no, I'm happy to answer the question. Um, I'm just trying to think about how best to frame it. So, um, we obviously have looked at how in this particular instance we could increase network capacity. So, so obviously our duty is primarily to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, and perhaps going back to your slightly earlier point, um, the fact that this took longer to fix is incredibly unusual. So you, your point about making sure that we absolutely understand the fact this has a hugely disruptive impact. Um, but I would probably point to the fact that this is the only time in the 10 years that I've been CEO that we've had something of this scale, um, which says to me that whilst we can always do better, actually, we generally get the response rates, the response rates correct. 
in terms of that level of network, um, manual network capacity, if you like, it very much depends on the failure mode. So if, for example, we had a situation where, I don't know, somebody was jamming all of the airwaves, then no matter how much manual intervention we applied, we wouldn't be able to resolve it. For this particular incident, we have gone back and looked at, could we have more people manually inputting flight plans? Now, we have systems that are there designed for specialists to fix flight plans that have been incorrectly input by airlines. Mm -hmm. It is quite a technical job. It's quite a slow process because it is a manual input. Um, You could obviously train more people to do that, but from a practical perspective, they they probably wouldn't be utilised almost ever. Um, because of course the, the other challenge we have is we very rarely see problems like this twice this one is resolved we're satisfied it's completely resolved but we are looking at are there other things we could do to make sure that the network capacity is maintained as high as possible and as safe as safely as possible thank you i've just got a couple of uh, supplementaries following on from uh, gavin's questions firstly on the the review you're doing of the escalation protocols. Um, can you just give me a little more detail on the time scale of when you expect that review to have concluded uh, and whatever you can decide as the, the, the appropriate new system, uh, when that would be in place? Um, so parts of it are already in place, but Catherine, I think, we're, as we said, we're planning to get this in before sort of the summer school holidays. Yes, yeah, so before the... the busy, busy school holidays. As I said, we've got our um, bronze teams all in training at the moment, um, and our silver are due to commence sort of late May, early June. Um, We had a gold exercise actually just last week Mm -hmm. where we were uh, trialling out the new escalation processes um, for ourselves and the way that we would um, run gold going forward. that's all, that's all in hand. Um, I'm keen that we have it in before this summer. I'm also keen that we continue the work with our airline and airport partners on um, the notifications that we give them and um, the timeliness of those notifications because it's difficult in any scenario, as Martin has said, that normally these issues get resolved and time is of the essence because when you don't know how quick it's going to get fixed, it makes decision making very challenging when you are trying to run the operation so there's a lot of work that will continue and is ongoing and is ongoing um, with our partners hence the reason as well that we want to do the exercise post summer so that we can go and test some of the conversations that we are um, having at the moment just before I turn to other colleagues uh, one other question when the interim report uh, came out uh, there was a, quite a bit of commentary in, in the media that this was a, a symptom of the working from home uh, culture. And I understand the, 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 the explanation you gave of the, the, the sort of tiers of, of, of engineering support. But had, had that system that was in place last year, had that been in place for a long time or had the pandemic and the post-pandemic period caused you to change that level of uh, you know, engineering on-call and in-person support? That's a very good question, actually. No, um, I should first of all say our engineers do a fantastic job. Um, Almost none of them, probably none of them, uh, work from home other than when it's appropriate to do so. So the second line engineers we're talking about here are at work during the week. Um, But because they're senior engineers and very specialist engineers, they are generally at work during the week because they are working on new projects. The working from home piece was actually more of a bonus because... We now have the technology since the pandemic to allow them when they are outside of their hours where they would normally be working at work, if they are called on call, then they can immediately work remotely to try and diagnose the problem. So before the pandemic, it would have been worse. We would have had to have got them physically in immediately. Now we have the ability for them to log on appropriately and securely remotely. And in many cases, they fix the problem much more quickly than if they had to come into the office outside of normal hours. So it's an absolute, uh, an absolute um, advancement in how we deal with these things. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Paul, you wanted to... Yeah, just to, uh, uh, to build upon the, the comments that we have made around your gold, silver, bronze training sort of thing. It's, um, there's a, two aspects to the question, really. One, um, you said you're training sil- bronze at the moment and you're going to move to silver. Um, 
why aren't you doing them in parallel rather than in series? You know, why aren't you just why haven't you got you know, a, a gold training session going, a silver session going, and a, and a bronze going? Why why wait to finish one before you move to the next? And the other part to the question is. Does that mean you actually know what you want to train on all of these bits now? So you, it is just a training exercise as opposed to a decision making as to how you're going to actually manage um, the, the, the new world order as you see it in terms of, in terms of um, problem re resolution. So the reason that we're not running it concurrently is because we, we have a bronze, silver and gold process that's in place, but it, it, is not, it doesn't have the single point of decision making. So what we're doing is we're bringing the um, collaborative decision making into one point in bronze and the same at silver. So there was an operational team and a technical services engineering team. And what we're doing is we're joining those two bronzes and those two silvers together. Hence the reason that we're doing it, we're running it separately. They will, we will do concurrent training and we'll exercise this ahead of ahead of the, um, the, the, summer, the summer process. Um, in, in terms of your second question, we will be, um, the, overall, um, the overall exercising and the, the work that we're doing with our airlines to test the different scenarios is going to inform how we take that forward. Um, we are talking to them in a very different language at the moment. We're talking to them in a customer language and language that they understand. So we talk in delay minutes, airlines and airports talk in punctuality minutes. So what I'm trying to do and what we are trying to do, the team are really um, on this, is actually drive some of that change into the way that we run the overall crisis management process. Maybe if I could just add as well, we are in parallel doing the gold training. Yes. There is one other challenge that, that Catherine didn't mention. Many of the people that were involved in this are obviously also rostered on to lots of other work ahead of the summer and in preparation for the summer. So some of it is just about making sure we have the right people in the right place at the right time so that we don't impact the normal day stay operations while we go through this retraining. Okay, I'm just trying to get confidence that you actually have you know, a determined plan that you're trying to train yep. people to yep. as opposed to um, your doing this bit and you're still working out what you're going to do on that bit? No, I mean that's uh, that's not what we're doing because we've, we've got a command and control structure that we've been using over the winter period where we've had various incidents, so the storms as I described, and um, this is enhancing it um, and bringing it more in line with what, as I said, our airport and airline partners operate today and also um, our emergency service partners as well. Okay, one final point on that is just um, so at what point in time do you think that you would feel comfortable that you were if you like your escalation processes and control processes of an incident would be fully in, in, embedded and in place you're always going to look for refinement forever but in terms of feeling comfortable that you've got through the transition from where you were to where you want to be so I'm very comfortable now that we are ready for an event. So if something were to happen tomorrow, um, whether it be, and I think this, this relates to a, a question uh, uh, earlier, but if something were to happen, whether that be within our network or m more likely within the overall aviation network across the UK, we would be in a position to stand up our gold, silver and bronze. Everybody would know what they were doing. The majority of the lessons that we've learned from last year would be incorporated into there. So really what we're now talking about is the finishing touches to that. That will be done before we head into the sort of, I would say, um, school holidays. So before the end of June um, is probably a, a fair assessment. Um, but it is still, it is now more of an incremental finishing off rather than a massive restructuring of how we do it. So we are confident that we are in the right place. So now, Chair. Uh, Jack. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, scenario planning and exercises to test the systems and look at how you can respond because there doesn't seem to be very much of that that's been going on in the past with multi-agency involvement um, to do that. Why, why is it that we haven't done these sort of scenario planning and operation multi-agency operations in the past? Um, I, I'm going to have to use a bit of I'm going to have to sort of uh, try and give you my answer to that because I don't think I've got a full answer from an aviation system perspective. Mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic, I think uh, things were perhaps a little more joined up. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was, whilst there wasn't necessarily much multi-agency planning, 
there were probably at the time a lot more people in the industry in general with a lot of institutional knowledge of how things worked, um, such that when things went wrong, um, and I'm not talking specifically Nazi, but across the entire patch, everybody sort of knew how things worked. We were um, sort of reliant on that institutional memory, were we? I, I think there was, so I think, uh, maybe relying on it, what, I guess what I'm saying is I think that generally served the industry pretty well in terms of dealing with issues that came about. I think each individual organisation, whether it be airlines, airports, NATs, did a lot of its own internal scenario planning. Um, certainly from our perspective, we ran quite a lot of exercises every year and we have continued to do so. Um, we have quite a lot of gold training simulations as well. Um, but around about the time of the pandemic, I think it was around about the time of the pandemic, um, some of the forums where we all got together as an aviation system uh, drifted away. And for all sensible reasons, yeah, there, were, there were bigger, more pressing problems around the survival of, of the industry. Um, and I think some of those now and the work that Catherine's doing to bring some of that back together with the CAA's uh, support um, to do that multi-agency planning will pay dividends in the future. Who do you think should lead that? Because um, sort of the CAA said that they don't necessarily think they should. Um, that you know, is is the should it be the CAA or should it be system wide that there isn't a specific leader in in organising these simulations? It, so I we volunteered. I've put my hand up and right. volunteered, and actually that happened in January of this year at the CAA convened uh, operation. Director's Delivery Group, which is a, a joint group of airline and airport and ourselves, basically at COO and Ops Director level. Um, I think that we should do it in the same way that at an airport, an airport would every couple of years drill their emergency response to an aircraft crash. We will take the lead and do a system-wide issue that is a scenario based on us having a failure just to ensure that everybody is um, prepared and ready. I think what I'd pr perhaps add is that I think we see a role for the CAA in overseeing that, making sure it's done well, making sure it's got buy-in from everybody, as opposed to the operational running of the exercise. And I think what we're not saying is that we would always take charge of something that happened in the system. That would need to happen, by, as, as Catherine just said, by the, in, the group that was most affected, most likely. But we are in a slightly unique position because we do have a sort of bird's eye view of the entire European network, which is one of the reasons why we've tested this out with the storms over the winter, because we can give effectively help and advice and support to all of the parties in the network. So in terms of um, other um, international comparators, do they run these exercises already in other countries? Um, I'm not aware. I've spoken a lot to my counterparts in other countries over the course of the last six months on these topics. Um, I think we probably do more than most. Uh, I think possibly in the US um, there's a little bit more, and I think largely because of the relationship the CAA, because the FAA is also the regulator and the service provider, um, I think that probably makes a slight difference there. But I'm not aware of many countries doing entire aviation system simulations. Um, but we can follow up with that. I, I don't know the answer, but I don't think there is. Okay. In terms of um, wider multi-agency collaboration, are there other things that could be done, you know, other, other um, uh, things that we should see more collaboration on uh, beyond just uh, the simulation exercise? What, what sort of other things do you think uh, should be? Well, there is a lot of collaboration that goes on in the background, and in fact, uh, both Catherine and I very recently have been over in Brussels with Eurocontrol, the intergovernmental agency that looks at the network um, across the whole of Europe, along with the airlines, along with the airports and the ground handlers, um, to look at how uh, the, the, the programme is called All Together Now for the summer, so it's about pre-planning for the summer across the whole of Europe. Um, and we're playing an integral role in that just like everybody else's. So there's a lot of collaboration going on in that regard. We do a lot of collaboration um, with individual airlines and airports. So every day we have a network call uh, every single day looking at the next day to say actually what do we think is coming, what might be happening, what special events are there and the big football matches, uh, you know, the Olympics coming up, those kind of things. So there's already a lot of that going on. And we're looking at how that can be enhanced based on uh, based on the events of last year. But I wouldn't want to downplay the amount of collaboration that's already ongoing in the space. I don't want to stray on to what uh, my colleague's going to ask you in a minute about communication. But do you think in terms of the response to 
when there is an event, then there is a you know room to improve that collaboration between airlines, airports, and others um, to ensure that we have a proper response when when these events do happen. I am a very firm believer that you can always improve how you respond to these events. I mean, they are incredibly rare, thankfully. Um, as I said before, this is the first one that we've had of this scale in, in 10 years, certainly since my time as CEO. And um, whenever they happen, you know, we do our very best to extract every possible element of learning out of it that we possibly can. But we also try and learn from other people's uh, instance. So I think at the same time as we had our issue in the UK on the 28th of August, there was an Italian issue the same day, I think. There was a, a, last week, there was a complete outage of the Dutch air traffic system. Um, so we will learn from all of those to make sure that we can bring the best of it all together. Um, I think the challenge would always be in a busy summer, if something goes wrong, um, the, the, the operation, the system as a whole is is tight. You know, every seat is sold, um, and therefore <coughs> we all need to act very quickly. And that is particularly difficult if you're up against a technical problem that hasn't been seen before. If you know it's going to be fixed in 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you can make different decisions. So I think it's how we learn to deal with that. In this circumstance, we did have the benefit of time in some cases because some people were waiting several days, you know, several Correct. days later. Yeah. So, you know, we should have had staff there, shouldn't we, really, to respond and deal with passengers stranded at airports, not just one person serving on a, uh, you know, in a cafeteria when you've got thousands and thousands of people waiting in an airport. You know, that is just not a good response um, mm. to, to that sort of situation, is it really? I, well, I'd, I obviously. I mean, that's my personal. No, no, I, 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 I wouldn't disagree. I wouldn't disagree with your comment. All I'd say is that obviously that's much more a matter for airports than it is for us. Our, our job in those circumstances is, I think, communicate effectively, and and ultimately resolve the problem as quickly as we can. But really, first of all, make sure everybody is safe. But you're absolutely right. All of the other things have to work as well. Otherwise, it's a terrible experience for everybody. Uh, Paul. Thanks, Chair. I mean, just developing the whole you know, com communications conversation, if you like. Um, you know, for people to make decisions in a in a difficult situation when something's gone wrong, um, there needs to be clear clarity as to what's gone wrong, the, any um, opportunities to fix it, whether the risk is what the risk is going to be, who's involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it does feel as though in this occasion that just didn't work. You know, there's been quite a number of um, representations of delays in reporting the problem, in not knowing, in not communicating what the problem was um, adequately. Um, you know, how long it was going to last, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, I know we've also had questions about providing warning of the problem. It sounds to me as though it had got away that quick that in the first instance, I don't know how you provide a warning of the problem, but certainly in terms of what was happening and telling people what was happening, what have you done to make yourself feel? that you're in a better place going forward? Um, let me start, and then, and then I'm sure Catherine can pick up on some of the specifics. So um, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right in that the speed of communication is really important, but it's also a very fine balance. Um, if you look at the incident that happened on the 28th, um, we have never, uh, or certainly not in recent history, had a problem that's taken that long to resolve. So when we go into these problems, first of all, there is obviously an assumption that we will be able to fix it, and we will almost certainly be able to fix it, as I said, 54,000 and something times, um, without there being any impact to the public. And the thing that we have to balance, and that's exactly what we're looking at uh, as part of this, is at what point do we tell airports, airlines, general public, because it's probably the same thing, that there is a problem? What we don't want to be doing is doing that 54,000 times for there not to be a problem because that way would lead to probably some incorrect decisions being taken. So as Catherine was explaining, one of the things we're trying to do now is say to the airlines and airports, if we don't know what the problem is, at the earliest possible moment, we will say, look, we have a problem here. We think this could be serious if it's not resolved. We don't have an immediate outlook for it. But in your world, treat it as though you had a check-in system failure or you had a system with Met Office or something like that. So something that relates to them, so they can then go into their procedures, because one of the challenges we had on the day was everybody wants to know what the problem is, 
which isn't actually all that helpful for most people because it's going to be something very technical. What they really want to know is when is it going to be fixed and therefore what should I be doing about it? And of course, asking when is it going to be fixed repeatedly if we don't know doesn't help anybody prepare. So by putting in place effectively scenarios that say in these circumstances, treat it like this in your world, means they can make earlier decisions better decisions and everybody can resolve the situation more quickly the timing is just a bit that we will have to figure out because i don't to my mind to my knowledge it's, it's not done like that anywhere at the moment so that's something new that we'll be doing yeah i think there's a, a, a phrase you know sometimes you know, don't let uh, perfection be the enemy of the good absolutely and yeah. um, you know you, you were clearly on that curve of um you know if it's 50 percent of a risk it's prob possibly too early but you don't need to wait to 99.99 no, before you're correct. doing something and you've got to determine where that's at. And I think, you didn't quite use the words, but I think what you were trying to say was that what you were trying to, what you would want to communicate to the stakeholders is not necessarily what your problem was and how you were going to fix it, but what the impact was going to be on them. Exactly right. Because exactly. that's Absolutely. their world that they have to deal with. Yeah. Sorry, Catherine. Yeah, no, I was wanted. just going to add to that. The, the contingency plans are common consequence plans because actually it doesn't matter what the root cause is in most scenarios. It could be a cyber attack, it could be a loss of facilities, it could have been loss of resource. But it's how do you how do you manage to mass disruption in this case? And there's lots in my experience of working both for an airline and for airports, there are common consequence plans for dealing with mass disruption. The challenge is, is, and to Martin's point, because we have traditionally got the systems back up and running very swiftly, dealing with that level of ambiguity and, and not knowing is it going to come on, there is a natural decision-making worry of, do I make a decision to start cancelling things and actually it comes back up and I've caused myself, you know, more, more difficulty. So talking in their language and saying, plan as if it is a loss of a check-in, a loss of a global distribution system. Prepare your plans as to what would your first measures be, because these are all drilled, as Martin has said, in their own exercising, so that when, when and if we do have to push the button on this is happening, they're at least coming to the table with something that's ready to go as opposed to they're doing the thinking. Um, at a very late stage. Just just to probe that uh, the concept a, a little further, um, if you're sat on your side of the fence and you're, you, you really see your problems as to what they are, you see them from the scale of how they impact you. Um, sometimes what is a substantial impact to you can be a trivial impact to somebody else, or more pertinently in this case, a trivial impact to you could be a massive impact to somebody else. And it's how you get that clarity of what messages you should be getting to people and who are the priorities. And I, I understand um, you know, one of the questions that's, that was raised in the interim report was about the choice of communication platforms and things like this. And I would also ask you just to say what you're doing to try and look for where those sort of problems exist. Because if you go back in the not too distant future, None of us had Teams or Zoom or, th or we didn't see them as being things that were there. But you must have been sat there for a considerable period of time thinking, well, if we had an incident, we're going to have to compute to hit all of these multiple stakeholders. And that'll have been before COVID. In COVID, suddenly everybody's getting these better communication methods. Why wasn't somebody thinking, oh, we've got a problem about this. We've always had this problem of getting the communication out to a <coughs> breadth of people. These new platforms are existing. Let's get those in place before we get an incident where we've got to actually do it. Why wasn't there somebody looking at that before you got to the situation of having to deal with it? So I, I think the, the honest answer is there that the previous systems that we had had worked pretty well up to that point. Um, as you rightly say, Teams, the system we were using was not Teams, it is now. That has all been fixed and, and tested and used in earnest over the winter. Um, so we know that works. Um, what we saw on this particular occasion was significantly more people um, calling into the, the crisis call um, than we ever saw previously, uh, hundreds and hundreds more people, and, and that's what uh, ultimately meant it didn't work. Now, should we have... Oh, just, just to explore that further, yeah. can you give us an, an, uh, an insight into 
what sort of people were calling that didn't call before? Is it because you've got multiple organisations of the same thing? I mean, just explain that. Yeah, so bit. so it's multiple. So it's multiple organisations. This so this will be effectively every airport in the UK, every airline in the UK, plus anybody else who has you know some relevance to the sector. So it can literally be. I mean, it could be fifty people from the same organisation. So I mean, it probably isn't, but it could be. Um, and we had, I, I, I will check the numbers and we'll send them into the committee, but I think it was something like five or 600 people dialing in on the day. Um, that hadn't happened before in any of the things that we practiced previously or actually where we'd had incidents previously. Um, but I think you're absolutely right, understanding. Now, we did send out other messages as well, so it wasn't people didn't have nothing, but it wasn't as effective as it could have been, and we recognised that straight away in the interim report. So to your point around um, why didn't we think of it sooner, I think just... Uh, through the pandemic and because it had worked up until then it was seen to be sufficiently robust uh, and I think this was the opportunity or this was the example that showed up that actually we need to do something different and that's what, exactly what we've done. So I assume that you're now taking a look back and thinking of whether there's anything else that yeah, you should be doing differently absolutely. As, as well in that and what you know we've had um, you know representations about you know questions about you know whether the numbers that people affected and flights affected and everything like that have been accurately communicated through this yes. process. If there's doubt in the number of flights that were affected or the number of um, I incidents that were happening, how would you know who to be trying to connect to, th to, to, to communicate where the problem is if you don't even know what the right number of flights is? Rhetorical question is to... But, I, but actually it's a good one. I can give you an answer if you'd like and I think it probably would be helpful. I know there has been a lot of uh, speculation from some quarters as to whether or not we provided the right numbers um, on the day. Now, as I said in the interim report, and I think when, when we were here last time, um, we got all of our data from Eurocontrol, uh, which is independent. Uh, we went back over the numbers, and in our initial report, we said uh, that we thought 575 flights were delayed, um, and that they were delayed an average of about an hour and 50 minutes, and that up to 1,500 flights had been cancelled. Um, we weren't sure of the number because that's not collected anywhere centrally. Um, we've subsequently gone back and verified, and the number was 579 flights on the day, so we were four out on that, and it was now in 54 minutes was the average delay for those flights. Uh, the 1,500 flights that were cancelled, actually, um, there's been lots of talk of passenger numbers in the interim report. Um, we still haven't seen a definitive number of cancelled flights. There is no one, no central repository in the industry that collates that and obviously the panel has been trying to understand that for the last six months so I think if one of the findings that comes out of the panel's report is that there should be some form of collation of impact to flights that would be hugely helpful. Yeah. So I think it, it, it just makes sense to me that you, know, you need to know is, is it, is who you're trying to con communicate with, the extent to which you're communicating with, <coughs> etc, etc in, term, in, in terms of a platform. Um, I think I've covered all the points that I wanted to chair in, in terms of I'm just I wasn't sure there's something else but I think I'm just about there. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to uh, draw the session to a conclusion uh, by touching on uh, one area that follows on from uh, that, that last point. Uh, when you were in front of us in, in the autumn uh, along with uh, various airlines uh, a significant criticism was that the airlines had suffered uh, significant financial loss mm. uh, as a result of the problem. Um, have, has that debate moved on or do we need to await the final report before any calls are made on what uh, compensation or reduction in fees might be appropriate? <coughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so that is not something that we've discussed particularly with the panel. Um, I think they're obviously off discussing, one would assume they're off discussing that with the CEA and with the other parties, so we're waiting to see the final uh, results of that to see what, what the outcome is. I thought that would be the answer, but uh, I'd just check. Um, I think unless any other colleague wants to catch my eye, uh, that brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, it, as I say, it will be something we'll return to uh, when we have that final report, but it's been very helpful to have this update from you. Uh, while, while we get to that final stage. Uh, so th thank you both again for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much. Order, order. <laughs>
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.